This morning I'm going to do something at the outset that is quite different from my normal practice. For the benefit of those, those who will later listen to an audio recording of this message from God's Word or who will read this message after it is uploaded to the internet, allow me to describe what is about to happen. One young man will bring out a table and a plastic tub to place on top of the table on the floor of the auditorium in front of the platform and the pulpit. The purpose of the table is to elevate the demonstration so that as many people as possible in the auditorium can see what's happening. The purpose of the plastic tub is to make sure no water falls on our carpet during our demonstration. The other young man will bring out a small clear drinking glass and a considerably smaller thimble the type used by seamstresses and tailors. He will also produce a pitcher of water. Once the two young men and I are in place, one of them will hold the small clear glass over the tub, while the other holds above the small clear glass a thimble. I will position myself so that as many people as possible can observe me pouring the entire pitcher of water into the thimble. You will no doubt wonder whether I can accomplish this task. Before I step down to the auditorium floor to conduct the demonstration, allow me to designate the meanings of the items that you will see. The table represents a table. It means nothing in our demonstration and is used entirely for the benefit of convenience. The plastic tub on top of the table represents a plastic tub on top of a table and is used entirely for the benefit of convenience to keep the auditorium carpet as dry as possible. Now let us move on to the four items in our demonstration and their meanings. Imagine the small glass representing the entirety of the physical universe that God created on the first day, consisting of time, energy, mass, and space. To repeat, for the purpose of this demonstration, the entire physical universe and the time, energy, mass, and space continuum will be represented by a small clear glass. Now, I know that representation is a reach, but I am confident in your ability to imagine the glass as I have described it. The thimble will represent a single human body. I know the relative scale of the thimble to the glass is wildly disproportionate, but I'm asking you to give me a break. Just go with me during this brief demonstration. Can you do that? So you will have before you the entire physical universe represented by a small glass and one human body represented by a small thimble. You got that, right? I will end up holding a pitcher full of water. Imagine the pitcher to be absolutely nothing, easy to do since it's clear plastic. It does not exist in this demonstration except as a tool to help me control the water. Ignore the pitcher. In this demonstration, I'm going to pour all of the water that is in the pitcher into the small thimble held above the small glass. In a moment, I will pour all of the water from the pitcher. Notice that all of the water in the pitcher will flow nicely and neatly into the thimble. And now we will demonstrate what I have described.
holds the symbol over the glass. This is a single human body. And I'm going to pour all of the water into this symbol. Notice. how nicely it's going. <laughs> Thank you. Let's give them a hand. They did a great job. Everything did not happen exactly how I described that it would. The small clear glass wonderfully represented the expanse of our physical universe, and the smaller thimble wonderfully represented a human body. But something happened when I attempted to pour the water into the thimble. Most of the water would not fit into the thimble. Most of the water would not fit into the glass. Clearly, getting the entire pitcher of water into the thimble was an impossibility. Getting the entire pitcher of water into the glass was also an impossibility. Getting all of the water from the pitcher into the glass was not just an impossibility, it was an absurdity. Getting all of the water from the pitcher into the thimble was not just a greater impossibility, it was an even more audacious absurdity. And don't think that you can squeeze water of that volume into the small vol volume of the glass or the small volume of the thimble. Water is well known to be an incompressible fluid. It is not possible to squeeze it into a volume that is less than the volume of the water, to do so would result in the destruction of the thimble and the destruction of the glass. Yet in this terrible demonstration, I have sought to illustrate to you the impossibility of the incarnation of the, internal, of the eternal Son of the living God. I have sought to illustrate to you the impossibility of God, the creator of the universe and all that herein is, who is more immense than this vast universe he has created, stepping into his universe. Yet he did. I think God becoming a man, stepping into his creation the way he did, is what philosophers might refer to as an ontological impossibility. Yet the angel Gabriel, when informing the Virgin Mary that this very thing was about to happen, with her being the thimble, who would give birth to the thimble who was God manifested in the flesh, said in Luke chapter 1 verse 37, for with God, nothing shall be impossible. Before we turn to my text for today, let us agree to be gentle with one another. <laughs> I will not insult your intelligence by suggesting that my demonstration with the pitcher of water, the thimble, and the small glass is anything like a reasonable representation of Christ's incarnation. My demonstration was conducted solely for the purpose of pressing into your memory the imagery of how impossible it is for something that is bigger to fit into something that is smaller. In return, I ask you to grant to me 
the awareness that my demonstration does not do justice to the physical universe and individual human body, much less the infinite God. Will you grant me that? Additionally, will you fix your mind on something for me? Are you willing to think about the impossibility of the Son of God, whose immensity is infinite, becoming a man and occupying a body prepared for him, which began as a single cell in the womb of a young Jewish virgin named Mary. With that in mind, I invite you to turn to John chapter 16, verse 28. John chapter 16, verse 28, when you find that portion of God's word, I invite you to stand for the reading of scripture together. You read silently while I read aloud. John chapter 16, verse 28, where the Lord Jesus Christ said, I came forth from the Father and am come into the world again. I leave the world and go to the Father. Won't you please be seated? These words were spoken shortly before the Lord Jesus Christ's high priestly intercessory prayer of John chapter 17. And shortly before our Lord's season of prayer that took place in the Garden of Gethsemane. And also shortly before his betrayal by Judas Iscariot to the soldiers who took him into custody. The next morning... He was crucified. Three days later, he rose from the dead. With this statement, the Lord Jesus Christ set forth the entirety of his saving activity in four concise phrases, with two of the phrases referring to what he had already done and two of the phrases referring to what he was about to do. Consider with me. First, the Lord Jesus Christ declared his generation. I came forth from the Father. Notice how this phrase is connected to the final phrase of the previous verse. Verse 27 ends, And have believed that I came out from God. Verse 27 is the Lord's acknowledgement that his disciples believed that he came from God, that he was sent by God. The verse before us is the Lord Jesus Christ's assertion that what these 11 men believed to be true was in fact true. Without getting into the woods of theological speculation, let me make mention of three confirmations that arise from this phrase in connection with the final phrase of verse 27. First, we have confirmation that God, as he was understood by those 11 Jewish men, the God of Israel, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God who spoke to Moses from the burning bush, is the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And as Jesus Christ is the eternal Son of the living God, so the first person of the triune Godhead is Christ's heavenly Father. Next, the Lord Jesus Christ, who those men believed came out from God and confirmed their belief by stating to them that he came forth from the Father, truly was sent by God the Father. He was dispatched. No wonder he is referred to in Hebrews chapter 3 and verse 1 as the apostle of our profession with the Greek word apostle meaning delegate, meaning envoy, meaning messenger. The Lord Jesus Christ came out from God, came forth from the Father because he was sent on a mission by God the Father. As he spoke to those men on their way to the Garden of Gethsemane that night so long ago, the goal of Christ.
Christ's mission was coming to a climax. Third, make no mistake about the eternity of the Lord Jesus Christ or the nature of his essence being identical with the essence of God the Father. Jesus Christ is God. Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Jesus Christ came forth from God the Father. He and the Father are one in essence, yet somehow distinct as to personality. In no other way could he come out from God, come forth from the Father. Of interest to me, and without me pretending to understand what he meant by it, is that the Lord distinguished to his men a distinction between coming forth from the Father and what he stated in the second phrase. Next, the Lord Jesus Christ declared his incarnation. The second phrase reading, and am come into the world. This phrase is what I had in mind when the two young men and I conducted the visual demonstration at the beginning of my message. How does one characterize the infinitely more immense than the expanse of our universe God stepping into his creation, the glass, assuming human flesh at its conception as a single cell in the womb of a virgin, the thimble? How does that happen? How does deity of infinite magnitude and pristine holiness take up residence in a comparatively small universe without obliterating it? How does deity of infinite magnitude and pristine holiness take up residence in the minute body of a young virgin in the womb of that young virgin, much less in a single cell egg that would grow into the baby that would be delivered in Bethlehem. How does that happen? And how is it that we can contemplate these things and read about these things without it blowing our mind? What is the incarnation that this phrase refers to? Lewis Berry Chafer, noted theologian, who was the founder of Dallas Theological Seminary, writes, because of the immeasurable truths involved, the incarnation whereby a member of the Godhead is entering permanently into the human family and becoming a part of it, proves one of the seven greatest events in the history of the universe. As follows, number one, the creation of angels. Number two, creation of material things, including all life on earth. Number three, the incarnation. Number four, death of the incarnate one. Number five, his resurrection. Number six, his coming again to reign on the earth. Number seven, his reign on the earth forever and ever. Henry Clarence Thiessen, another theologian, writes, the scriptures teach that the pre-existent Christ became a man. The Word became flesh, John 1, 14. When the fullness of time had come, God sent forth His Son, born of a woman, Galatians 4, 4, who, existing in the form of God, emptied Himself, taking the form of a servant, being made in the likeness of men, Philippians chapter 2, verses 6 and 7. Since then the children are sharers in flesh and blood. He also Himself, in like manner, partook of the same, Hebrews 2, 14. <coughs> The historical account of this fact we have in the birth narratives in Matthew chapters 1 and 2 and Luke chapters 1 and 2, close quote. Here is a third explanation of the incarnation referred to by this phrase. Fundamentally, incarnation is a theological assertion that in Jesus the eternal word of God appeared in human form. John 1. Many theologians picture the Incarnation as the voluntary and humble act of the second person of the Trinity, God the Son, taking upon himself full humanity and living a truly human life. The orthodox doctrine of the Incarnation asserts that in taking humanity upon himself, Christ did not experience a loss of his divine nature in any way, but continued to be fully God. 
How do you read that without thinking, wow? The phrase, and am come into the world, the second phrase of John 16, 28, seems to be straightforward enough until you ask the questions the conscientious Bible student always asks, who, what, when, where, why, how? Who? This is Jesus Christ. But who is Jesus Christ? He is the eternal Son of God. He is the second person of the triune Godhead. He is the creator and sustainer of all things. That is who is speaking here and who he is speaking about here. <coughs> that should perk us up a little bit, don't you think? Second question, what? What is being referred to in this phrase? It's an, it's an ontological impossibility. It is physically impossible for the Son of God, who is more in every way than the universe he created, to step into the universe he created. Every law of physics is violated by the Incarnation. This is not something that any reasonable or rational being can conceive of as being true were it done by anyone other than God. Did the Lord Jesus Christ violate the laws of nature when he took upon himself human nature to be born in Bethlehem? It would be more appropriate to state that the lawgiver suspended the laws of nature or overruled the laws of nature or did something entirely differently than is usual when he did what he did. And he can do whatever he chooses. When? We do not know the precise day when this great miracle of incarnation took place. However, we can be certain that this miraculous incarnation did not occur on the day that we memorialize as Christmas. After all, Mary's delivery and Christ's birth were in every way normal and routine. What was marvelous and what was miraculous was his conception nine months earlier when the Holy Spirit of God overshadowed the virgin whose name was Mary. Where? As to the geographical location of this great miracle, it almost certainly took place in Nazareth. As to the physiological location of this great miracle, it took place inside the body of a virgin named Mary in her womb. For nine months, her womb was the dwelling place of the God-man. Oh. Why? Why did the Lord Jesus Christ become a man? Why did he leave heaven's glory, the very throne room of heaven, to assume sinless humanity? That is the next main point of this message. So far, the Lord Jesus Christ has commented to his men concerning what he has already done. The next two phrases, the second half of the verse, is his declaration of what he is going to do. And finally, we ask how. I don't pretend to know how. <laughs> but when you know who, you don't always need to know how. Amen? Amen. Third, the Lord Jesus Christ declared his crucifixion. The phrase reads again, I leave the world. Perhaps reminding these men what he had earlier said to them in the upper room when he told them, we read in John chapter 13, verse 33, little children, yet a while, yet a little while, I am with you. Ye shall seek me, and as I said unto the Jews, whither I go, ye cannot come, so now I say to you. Ponder this about the Lord Jesus Christ the next time you create a quiet time of Bible reading, prayer, meditation, reflection, and contemplation of the things of God and the Savior. Ponder this. He is the only person to ever decide 
he would be born. He is the only person to ever decide where he would be born. He is the only person to ever decide to whom he would be born. He is the only person to ever decide when to be born. He is the only person to ever decide to be born of a virgin. He is the only person to ever decide to rise from the dead. Amen. Circling back to the question of why he died on the cross of Calvary, can we, do bit, can we do any better than the prophet Isaiah in Isaiah chapter 53? I'd like to ask you to turn there if you would. Let me read that chapter and then conclude this point with 1 Peter chapter 3 verse 18. To underline the why of Christ's crucifixion as the death he chose to leave this world. Who hath believed our report? And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? <clears throat> For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of a dry ground. He hath no form nor comeliness, and when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed, and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shears is done, so he openeth not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment, and who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off out of the land of the living. For the transgression of my people was he stricken. And he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death, because he had done no violence, neither was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore will I divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he hath poured out his soul unto death, and he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bare the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. Mm. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 18, provides a wonderful summation. For Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. Well, yes, he left the world, but oh, how he left the world. And by rising from the dead in a glorified body, he did not re-enter the world. From his death on the cross, he has been otherworldly. Finally, the Lord Jesus Christ declared his ascension and enthronement. The final phrase reading, and go to the Father. Just as the Lord Jesus Christ declared his intention to leave the world... 
which would be accomplished by means of his crucifixion. So the Lord Jesus Christ declared his, his intention to return to the Father. However, between the crucifixion of the Lord Jesus Christ and his return to the Father, there, there is this matter of the resurrection from the dead. Where is the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to be found in the second half of verse 28? Did the Lord Jesus have the resurrection in mind as part of his comment, again, I leave the world? Or is it to be included as part of what he meant when he said, and go to be, and, and go to the Father? Honestly, I, I don't know how to answer that question. There can be no doubt that the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead is one of the most significant displays of power imaginable. It is also the absolute proof that the Lord Jesus Christ's offering for our sins was both acceptable and accepted by God the Father. Perhaps the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead should be recognized as integral to his death by crucifixion since it was not possible that death should hold him. However, it is also unimaginable to think of him returning to his Father in heaven apart from his humanity being glorified via the resurrection. What can be said is that following his resurrection at the precise time that he had predicted... The Lord Jesus Christ seems to have ascended to heaven several times. With his final ascension recorded in Acts chapter 1 verses 9 and 10. Which I read. And when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel. That seems to be his final descent. We cannot say with precision how many times the Lord Jesus Christ ascended to heaven for one reason or another before ascending the final time to be enthroned at his Father's right hand. One might suppose that the Lord Jesus Christ was somewhere following his resurrection, but where? We are not told where he might have been when he was not visible to his followers. Could he have ascended to heaven to return to earth temporarily to make appearances to his followers? Perhaps. That said, I think it is unlikely that he ascended to heaven prior to his first recorded post-resurrection appearance where he said to Mary Magdalene, touch me not, for I am not yet ascended to my father, but go to my brethren and say unto them, I ascend unto my father and your father and to my God and your God. Now why not touch him? Perhaps he had not yet ascended to heaven to offer the propitiatory sacrifice of his blood. This would fit the pattern of not touching Aaronic priests under the Mosaic system after the sacrifice had been slain and before the blood had been sprinkled on the altar. Soon after that, however, he allowed women to take hold of his feet. Eight days later, of course, the risen Savior challenged Thomas to thrust his hand into the wound made by the Roman's spear in his side. John chapter 20 and verse 27. That would suggest the glorified Lord ascended to heaven at least twice. What is the most significant, however, is that our Lord was seen by Mary Magdalene, then by other women, then by two witnesses on the road to Emmaus, and then there is the Apostle Paul's summary account in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 5 through 8. And then he was seen of Cephas, then of the twelve. After that he was seen of about 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain unto this present, but some are fallen asleep. After that he was seen of James, then of all the apostles, <coughs> And last of all, he was seen of me also as one born out of due time. Once the Lord ascended to take his place at the Father's right hand, 
He has remained so enthroned until the time of the rapture and the church age, the rapture of the church age saints, followed by his second coming. It should be noted that in John chapter, or excuse me, in Acts chapter 7, verse 56, we see indicated that Stephen, the first Christian martyr, reported that he beheld the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God just before he was stoned to death. Then there are Paul's accounts of seeing a vision of Christ on the road to Damascus. Now we ask the question, was Paul, while, dra while traveling to Damascus, was he given a vision of Christ from heaven? Where are we to understand the Lord as having been on this occasion? Was he in heaven and Paul saw that vision? Or was he there and Paul saw that vision? We don't know. We cannot answer every question that might be raised by the implications of our text. What we can be sure of is the Lord Jesus Christ's summation. <coughs> of his redemptive activity stated in John chapter 16 and verse 28. The verse very neatly falls into four parts, four phrases. Two of the phrases are, declare, are declarations by the Lord Jesus Christ of what he has done, with the first phrase declaring what he has done with respect to the Father, and the second phrase declaring what he has done with respect to the world, his incarnation. What a staggering accomplishment that was. What an incredible demonstration of God's power that was. The second half of the verse is Christ's declaration to his faithful followers what he was going to do. The third phrase, his declaration was about leaving the world, which he would do the very next day with the grisly brutality of the Roman execution that culminated in his death on the cross. The fourth phrase, declaring that he would return to the Father, encompasses both Christ's final ascension to heaven and his enthronement at the Father's right hand. Spend some time mulling this verse over in your head. What incomprehensible demonstrations of power must be wielded, especially for the accomplishment of the second, third, and final phrases. There is no way a mortal human being can get his mind around such things as the Lord Jesus Christ stated in this single verse. Which brings to mind a question. Are you sure you want to remain an adversary of the Lord Jesus Christ? You do well to carefully pick your adversaries. You want to choose carefully your enemies. Do you want him to be one of them? Huh. Can you conceive of what he has mentioned to his men in a most matter-of-fact fashion? Yeah, I did this and this, and I'm going to do this and this. You have never before in your life, I guarantee, you have never before in your life given thought to more a few of the many things mentioned in this message. You have never before re reflected on your opposition to a Savior who has demonstrated his power to achieve things that are ontologically impossible. These things cannot be done! Yet he did, and he did again, and he did again. You have never before contemplated an adversarial relationship with someone who suspends the laws of nature to accomplish what he has purpose to do. Yeah, I think I'll suspend gravity for a minute while I stroll across the lake to my friends. 
Yet you who are not very much capable of accomplishing even the possible. Can you even accomplish the possible? I'm 70 years of age. I did pretty good in school. I've done okay. But I would not credit myself with being a person who could accomplish even the possible. Not even the possible. And yet you are okay with an adversarial relationship with someone who has a 100% track record at accomplishing the impossible. So are you willing to continue that opposition? to someone who has demonstrated his power again and again and again to do the impossible. And to what end has he demonstrated such power to the end of saving you from your sins? He came to die. In order to come to die, he had to become a man. He then had to die a sinner's death. He then rose from the dead and returned to where he came from. What he is doing now from his throne in heaven is saving sinners who trust him. And he will continue saving sinners who trust him until the appointed time to take his own who are still alive and remain on the earth to heaven. Then he will come again. He is coming again. So before it is too late, because if you wait until then, you have waited too long. Before it is too late, you need to consider the claims of Christ and you need to trust Him. Yeah. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your goodness. We thank you for this astonishing verse overlooked by so many commentators. I just, I wonder why. So much that we cannot get our minds around the implications fully. But it is a testament to our magnificent Savior. What astonishing power. What accomplishment. And I pray that as we reflect upon these things, those of us who know Christ will glory in the relationship made possible by him. And we thank you for drawing us to him. We appreciate the Spirit of God birthing us, this miracle of the new birth. And pray, Father, that you might work also in the lives of of those who are here today who do not know the Savior. The Lord Jesus Christ is the most wonderful ally. There can be no worse adversary. Please bless, and we will thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.